day eight of the August 98 10-day retreat in spring water. Somebody said this morning, there's so many expectations in the mind. Right now, the expectation that something that was an open state of being may come back. <laughs> And then the person added, isn't it natural to have expectations? And listening for a moment, looking, the response was, it is natural to be without expectations. That's how it feels when the mind is not engaged in expecting. It is naturally open and at peace, not the, not the thinking mind. The thinking mind just quiet. Presence, openness. Is the crow expecting something or just cawing and flying, landing, feeding? Because one observes, rather than, why do we say something is natural? Often it is sort of a, a gentle excuse, one doesn't want to be full of expectations, but one is, so one says it's natural. That's how the mind usually proceeds. But we can look, what is it about expectations? And one finds that there is a real impulse, I might even say an addictive impulse, of thought to project things that could happen pleasant things, something nice that will happen later on, kasha and sweet potatoes, something like, if this is pleasant for one, some people don't like. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one frame of projection of something nice to happen is already responded to, the, the, the organism feels energized, we say, I'm looking forward to this. There's a, some pleasure in expecting nice things to happen and the opposite, displeasure, fear, whatever emotion corresponds to imagining something bad to happen. Both are impulses of the brain. projecting the pleasurable to create pleasurable energies and projecting the dangerous things, potential misfortunes that could happen to maybe prepare oneself, protect oneself, try to solve it, always at work, always at work. And maybe for a brain as highly evolved and with as much of a history as the human brain, for such a brain it's 
quote unquote natural to be expecting. It goes with it, with its conditioning, with its function, to protect and to energize, to make happy. But brain function, projections, pleasurable energies or, uh, or frightful energies are not everything we are. It is the tiniest tip of this enormous iceberg without boundaries. Is it possible to be without expectation? Or what are we without expectations? Whatever the question may be. And listen, not just ask the question and expect an answer, or ask it repetitively like a mantra. If a question occurs, it asks for silence for quiet listening, looking inwardly. Expecting nothing. Which reminds me right now, somebody saying this morning, I come here in great need of quietness. I don't have much time for retreats. But when I come here, there is just savoring quietness, a real need for it and dissolving in it, if you will. Coming here, this person said, out of this tumultuous life, so hectic, so engaged, often so confused, and Coming here, one has been here before, sitting down, and it's quiet. And I don't want to ask any questions. I don't have any questions. I don't need any questions. Does this speak to some people's condition? I think we mentioned it earlier in the retreat. There doesn't need to be any question when there's spaciousness, withness, openness, presence. No feeling of division or fragmentation. Sitting not knowing is the same as questioning. Not knowing is this openness of no fixation on what I know, what must happen or what shouldn't happen. Letting what is happening be there. See, this quietness is so much misunderstood. It doesn't mean that there's no thought in the mind. It can be that way. But usually it is not. Quietness is no interference with what is taking place. Letting it be. Generously. You may say, trustingly, that all of this, one knows from one's experience, is temporary, transitional, coming and going. In the midst of an immovable silence. Noise happening in an immovable silence, does that make sense? Silence meaning letting it be. No meddling. No making stories out of what is happening to me right now and immediately reacting to the story of poor me or great me. Watch the story making. That's one of the most profitable engagements in sitting. Watching story making. How it happens so quickly, 
almost seemingly inevitably, abstracting from what has just happened and making a colorful story out of it. Sort of a continuous chapter from the last story. And living in that, reacting to that, Watch it when you get angry or afraid. What are you reacting to? Is it the momentary thing that somebody said or a thought that occurred? Or is it what it hooks into? The whole network of stories is not just one. Watch it, how it arises and how there is caught upness or almost getting caught up in the story. If it is caught, it withers instantly if it is caught with, with wisdom, with understanding. That is no way, no place to live. It's a tenuous, anxious, excitable, agitated, and unreal state, which so often is made the dwelling place of the mind, the story, or just a headline. No good, nobody loves me. Or oh, I'm better than the others, I'm something special. Somebody mentioned a few days ago how suddenly all thoughts ceased. It was the strangest, most amazing way of being. Fully in touch. No thoughts. That was several days ago. And then later, outside, sitting outside, so many thoughts. And <clears throat> the question, how come all this engagement with the thoughts, when there are the crickets and the airplanes and the breathing, was that just a dream? That's a very frequent thought. Something has happened which is un seemingly unprecedented, amazing, inexplicable, complete presence, no thoughts. And then in retrospect, out of this living in thought and reaction and dreaming and fearing and whatever all goes on in this body-mind, in retrospect, one thinks that was unreality, that was a dream or a trance. It's so difficult to see thoughts and thinking and fantasizing as just that, and not be taken in by it as though it presented our reality. And it takes some presence, some awareness, and some wisdom, which also accrues from past experiences. Working with this over the years, there is more wisdom about these changing states of mind and body. I told one person that last night I slept for a couple hours and then awake and a barrage of thoughts. And the person interrupted me. She said, you? Yes. <laughs> it's human, human mind, human consciousness, human being, and human thoughts. They weren't just felt as my thoughts. They're thoughts. Thoughts are probably floating around like radio waves or TV waves. <laughs> Thank you. 
And then the thought, I must sleep, I need to go back to sleep, forget about it. It doesn't work. Just this more sort of subtle agitation at what's happening. Let it be. I, I can't recall one thought right now that was there. And they were not taken for real, but they were a real nuisance. <laughs> This morning, coming in here and sitting down, no thought, it was gone. Maybe I should have come down here. But then if you're down here, you're not sleeping anyways. Then you're awake. Maybe not everybody, people also nod off. But this lying down in the age-old sleeping, dreaming position is not, for me at least, the easiest to be not free of thoughts, but that they, that they don't noose, that they don't bother, that they don't affect the body. That's, that's the nuisance. One thought, it could be a trivial thought, and already the heart is going more than normal, more than its sleeping rhythm. Nothing to get excited over, particularly as you take a second look, but this organism is so responsive. Somebody said this morning, the, the, the hearing gets more and more sensitive so that even sometimes a close by cricket or grasshopper hurts with its, uh, with its music, or its sound. And likewise, this organism in doing this work over the years loses more and more of its resistances and blockages. It's every, every nerve conducts more freely without running into resistance. And it means one thought and the body already responds. There's no resistance to it. Which can be called one's occupational hazard. <laughs> the secret of it all, or the art of being, is to let it all be. Not to want it to be different. That's when conflict starts and energy collisions, the energy of what's going on colliding with the energies of it shouldn't be this way, I want to change it. So as we discover this collision of energies, I don't want it this way, can that be let go? Not wanting it this way? And just being with what's there, what is there? I don't know, but there can be listening, opening, without efforting. Efforting is always willpower. I have to have it different. And one person mentioned it last night, it was, or this morning. There is so much willpower expanded, this person said, on keeping these thoughts in abeyance, because if they're not kept in abeyance, I get involved in them, lost in them. And asking, what, what do you do to keep thoughts in abeyance? The response was, it's almost physical resistance. Physical bracing. Somewhere or other, the body has learned to, to, to stuff some 
some conduction lines or holes. But it takes effort, wanting. This whole complex of meanness is involved in that, what I want to happen and what should not happen, what I'm afraid that could happen. So the suggestion was just let it all go and see what happens. Sometimes having plodded along six, seven days with this effort, one may find to one's great surprise it is not needed. The crickets are humming on their own. The listening takes place on its own. And there is no division between the two. Because there's no listener. No efforter. Just natural being. And call, call, call. Again, this is sort of a new trust unfolding. Up till now, one has trusted one's willpower, and it has had an effect, as this person confirmed. It is possible to keep thoughts in abeyance, but it is a massive, massive effort, exhausting. And now, turning over a new leaf, trusting that this is not needed, experimenting with it, if you will. And if there's lostness in the thoughts, so be it. Happens anyways, the moment one leaves the retreat or this hall, doesn't it? Maybe not. Maybe one notices that even in lostness in sleep, dream, or thoughts, there is an awareness. That's the most amazing discovery. Even dreaming, there can be awareness. So, that's, that's the one thing in life which can be trusted. Is this awareing presence, which is not some state of voidness, but totally filled with airplane and crickets. And wisdom, love, compassion, not concepts, not things I have to train. They're there, free for the giving the operating on their own with no willpower needed to get them into motion. Yesterday somebody asked, are you afraid of dying? And the immediate response was no. Qualifying it, I wouldn't look forward to a painful, agonizing death. But the mind does not project those specters right now. And there's also a trust, deep trust, that whatever happens can be met in some unfathomable way, unpredictable and un, yeah, unimaginable. It, it, it eludes the imagin imagination, this thing of meeting completely even excruciating pain. And 
What else was added was that in flying an airplane, I used to be afraid when I first did, flying back home to Switzerland, worrying about this thing crashing. I still had propellers. Today, I'm not afraid of crashing. If the plane crashes, we'll all go down together. So be it. That's the feeling. What I don't like, I also added, is this turbulence of going up and down. <laughs> you can have it. I don't like it. And also creates some fearful sensations in the mind. But why, why, why not afraid of dying? When one was so afraid in earlier years. Is it because in this sitting, listening, we talked about the darkness of not knowing. There is a letting go of attachment to self-image, self-story, a letting go of imagination, what I am, what I will be. All of that is let go. Fly with the winds like the milkweed seeds, off they go. In presence, darkness, not knowing, there's no holding on to, to body sensations. They're there, are they there, who knows? They are part of this whole palpitating energy, which is also not played up. Nothing is played up. It's just being without being somebody, without needing to be anything. Which can be called dying while living. Which is really the epitome of living, if they can be dying to all the old stuff, all the, the imagery stuff, which is so constricting, so painful, so alienating from each other. I get angry at you because you hurt my self-image. You don't treat me right. It's so free to let go of it. There's no loss in that, no renunciation. Not that it's gone forever, these, these uh, conditioned tracks are deeply <clears throat> ingrained in the body. They can surface and can be seen and understood again and again. So, Dying while living from moment to moment. That's, that is the fullness of living. Is it? Isn't it? Not needing to maintain a heavy story about oneself and the others. Dragging it behind one. this moment, just being, just listening, not knowing. And not needing to, 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 to hold on to handles and railings, which are of the imagination. being without handles and railings.
Does this talk need an ending? <laughs> it's already ended. End here for today. 